America, far more than elsewhere, the railways invented big business. Railroads were our first really big business in the United States. Other businesses were backyard tinkering operations. Oh, sometimes there was a factory, but that factory existed in one city. Railroads operated from city to city, state to state. We had never seen anything like it in the world. For three quarters of a century, the railway companies dominated America. Their grand strategies would decide the private destinies of millions of Americans. The great push in American railways came in the 1860s, just after the Civil War. 1,800 miles of track were laid from the Mississippi out to the West Coast. A railway crossing the entire country was finished in just four years. The first transcontinental railroad was the largest and greatest and am most ambitious project ever taken on in the United States up until the time it was constructed. It took large armies of forces of men to uh, build the railroad. They didn't have automatic machinery in those days. It took uh, a lot of horsepower, manpower, and plenty of perseverance to get the job done. It also took more capital than had ever been raised before. From the 1860s, curbside brokers sold railway shares in an outdoor market on New York's Wall Street. Stock speculation was new to America, and it became the rage. For the first time, people who had nothing to do with finance became involved in speculation. Women were coming down from uptown and standing in line at brokerage houses in order to take a gamble on railroad stocks. Clergymen were, were gambling on railroad stocks. Uh, the lunch counter, the first fast food restaurant in the world, was invented in New York in the early 1860s because people didn't have time to go back home for lunch. They had to have fast food, so it was invented for them. And that was mostly due to railroad speculation. The railways created a new American elite, financiers like Morgan, Harriman, Gould, and Vanderbilt. The boom would last until the First World War. In 1870, two and a half billion dollars of railway shares were issued. By 1890, the volume had quadrupled. My grandfather was a clerk on the exchange at the turn of the century. On a very hot summer day, all the windows were open. There was no air conditioning, of course. And he was counting stock certificates, and a breeze wafted through the office and picked up a certificate for 5,000 shares of the New York and Haven and Hartford Railroad and floated it out the other window and for it floated down onto Pine Street. And my grandfather was then 17 or 18 years old, went running down the stairs as fast as he could run and out onto Pine Street and there, much to his relief, was approximately a million dollars in railroad securities lying in the gutter. Nobody paid any attention to it. Having laid all this track, the railways now had to make it pay. The Transcontinental Railroad made it possible to get across the country over what was called the Great American Desert, that is west of the Mississippi River. And there was nothing there. And the railroads were granted lands on either side of the railroad. 
as not only an aid to the construction, but to provide populace to support the railroad after it was built. The railways had a vested interest in settling the West. They ran immigrant trains. Families traveled with their livestock and farm machinery, all in the same wagon. With offers of free passage and cheap land, people from East Coast America and even Europe were persuaded to go west. My grandparents saw ads in the papers and they um, indicated that life in America would be superior to that of any place else. And Germany was having problems at that time with the uh, political problems. And the land was becoming crowded and so a lot of people were anxious to seek something better. The colonization of the American interior by the railways continued into the 20th century. As late as 1910, the railways were recruiting farmers from Europe to sow the seeds of enterprise along their tracks. Throughout the years, the railways employed men called colonization agents. The colonization agent, which was what my father was for the Chicago, Burlington and Quincy Railroad, was a person who went back east and actually recruited people to come back to the Midwest and to settle along the railroad lines. And they would actually say, you know, come out where the air is good and the land is plentiful and the land is also cheap. Well, my grandmother was very disappointed and uh, could hardly believe what she was seeing because in her homeland of Germany, there were a lot of trees. And when they arrived at the homestead, all she could see was a treeless plain. But she decided that this was her choice and she would make the best of whatever came. They moved to prairie that had never been farmed. There was no timber for houses to protect them from the harsh climate. My grandmother had several barrels outside of the sod house door. These she filled with snow so that she would have water for cooking and washing. It was a very difficult life. My father would look for desirable people, and uh, the desirable people they were looking for were those that they knew would be successful, those who were going to be able to take it. As he worked with people, he would say, if you prosper, then we, the railroads, are going to prosper also. So they would actually advertise this. You prosper, we prosper. The settlers had to do more than survive. The railways needed a return on their investment. They wanted the farmers to be successful and to ship their produce by rail. Railroad economics are very different from, say, manufacturing economics, because in manufacturing economics, if you're not making money, you can close down the factory until demand picks up. But railroads are First, they're extremely capital intensive. You have to have the right of way, you have to have the road bed, you have to have the tracks, you have to have the rolling stock, um, and you have to keep to a regular schedule, which means the train runs whether it's empty or full. Because of the peculiarities of transportation 
economics. It was in the railroad's interest to go out there and promote aggressively business, to teach farmers how to grow better crops and more crops. They educated them. They had schools on wheels, if you will. And these were called uh, educational trains. And they might be about 10 cars long. The cars would be gutted out, and then they would have exhibits. The people would come through. Sometimes as many as 3,000 people would go through one particular train. Now, the towns knew that they were coming because there was a lot of advertising that had gone on beforehand. In some instances, the businesses would have uh, their little homemade displays that would talk about the train that was coming. And uh, then they also would have flyers. The high school bands would be there. Children would be involved in making posters, and sometimes they'd dress up, maybe as chickens if it was the poultry special train. In fact, the poultry train was an important one, I thought, because for many, many years we had the talking rooster up in our attic that was on that train. In the Midwest and beyond, the railways also determined where thousands of new towns would go. At that time, uh, the locomotives would only operate about 100 miles across, and it was usually a full day to get across that 100 miles, especially with a freight train. So as a result, they would set up a little terminal about every 100 miles. And this terminal consisted of not only a station, but it would have a hotel and an eating house, usually shops. And of course, that's what also brought in uh, manpower. Uh, it was railroad workers, too, that, uh, that created the towns. Towns seemed to go up almost overnight. British traveler saw a train laden with household goods pull up in the middle of the prairie. The conductor addressed his passengers. Gentlemen, here's Julesburg. Another railway town was born. over at the little town of Plum Creek, where they were going to make a station, the UP Railroad uh, said, well, we won't make a stop unless you move your town to one of our sections. And so uh, in about 1882, 1883, somewhere in that area, the little town of Plum Creek was moved just to the west about a half a mile so it would be on a railroad section. Bill Robb, Joe Jeffrey's great-grandfather, was a plumber who saw a Union Pacific poster and headed out west. He became a rancher, raising hogs and cattle, business that would not have been possible before the railway. We're standing right here on the Oregon Trail. The Pony Express and the Oregon Trail are right where we're standing right now. We're right through thousands and thousands of wagons, but the delivery system was very inadequate. And by having the railroads come here, great granddad could load the cattle that he was raising, put them on the livestock cars, and ship them to the markets back east. Over time, Bill Robb would buy more than 30,000 acres from the Union Pacific. The family fortune would depend on the railways for another three generations. Sundays was a great event around here. We would all gather down to the stockyards and load train after train. It seemed like, to me as a youngster, that we just never got through loading cattle. It was a great event to watch the cattle go in the boxcars. cars. 
the railways would transform the great American desert into one of the most fruitful agricultural regions in the world. All produce from the new heartland went by rail to market in Chicago. Cattle trains terminated at Chicago's stockyards. Just a mile square, think of that. A mile square of stockyard pens, livestock move in in the morning, unloaded from the trains. At least for a young man like myself, what was I, 20, uh, and eyes wide open, it was really a, a very exciting place to be. And, uh, you know, there must have been uh, 20,000 people working in the plants. The fantastic growth of the meatpacking business was made possible by the refrigerator car. It was quite simply a wagon that could be filled and refilled with ice. But its commercial implications were enormous. Meat could now be butchered in one central place and shipped frozen thousands of miles across country. In a decade, meat packing went from being a seasonal business to a multi-million dollar enterprise. In 1900, the stockyards were bought by a railway, the Chicago Junction. The CJ would set the pace of work, scheduling the times to pull the loaded wagons out of the yard. The CJ, we all call it the CJ. And you, if you were working on a loading dock, the man said, the CJ's going to be here. Your boss said, it's, they're coming for a 3 o'clock pull. I want every one of those cars filled now, and no fooling around. Hey, so jump to it. You worked like the Dickens, speed up, speed up, speed up to make the pull. That was crucial to make the pull. If the car didn't go that night, it was going to have to lay over the next day. It meant unhooking the car. It meant all kinds of misery. So the railroads really ran the tempo of uh, the shipping departments. Engines coming. Be ready for the pull. From a cattle market, Chicago grew into the world's busiest railway center, the hub of 11 lines which fanned out across the American continent. Chicago became a magnet for new businesses. Railway companies like the CJ developed them to guarantee a constant supply of freight to move. The central manufacturing district, built by the railway, brought all kinds of new factories into existence, turning out everything from industrial machinery to batteries and chewing gum. national markets for great big capital intensive manufacturing enterprises like steel. The great industrial boom in the United States in the latter part of the 19th century would not have been possible had the railroads not been there because you couldn't have these enormous economies of scale that made these companies very profitable without the railroads to sell all over the country. For the settler on the prairie, Chicago became the source for all basic necessities. Sears Roebuck pioneered a new type of business, mail order. Edward Sears was a former railway station clerk who began his business career when he sold a box of watches left unclaimed in his depot. By 1900, Sears was the greatest shopkeeper in America. developed as a catalog supplier in which they were able, through the use of the railroad, to print and distribute their catalog nationwide, and people could order through the mail anything, including houses. You could actually buy an entire house through the Sears catalog, all the parts and components. that you would order through Sears would be 
shipped by rail and distributed locally. Well, the biggest thrill of my life was that when I was 10 years old, I received a Beckwith upright piano as a birthday gift, and it came from Sears Roebuck. It arrived in Eustis by train. It was crated in a wooden box, and they were able to load this big piano onto the lumber wagon. And I recall it was just getting dusk as they arrived home. And I was so excited that I was hardly able to play, but I remembered that my father liked a little tune long, long ago. And so I stumbled through that for them and they all clapped and I was thrilled to pieces because now I could take music lessons on a piano. Rock Island Line is a road to ride. The Rock Island Line is a mighty good road. If you wanna ride, you got to ride it like you fight it. Get your ticket at the station for the Rock Island Line. As more and more railways were built, competition for passengers and freight got tougher. Oh, the Rock Island Line is a mighty good road. The Rock Island Line is a road to ride. The Rock Island Line is a mighty good road. If you wanna ride, you gotta ride it like your body. Get your ticket at the station for the Rock Island Line. The competitive climate began during the land grant era when railroads first were uh, constructed from the Mississippi River to the uh, West Coast. In many cases, only one line would receive the uh, land, and so you had speculators building uh, competing routes and in an attempt to keep the competition from completing their route and gaining the land, railroads actually employed armies and they had cannon on the route. And while the uh, railroads were being built, cannon would blast away at uh, each of the uh, groups of builders. There were an awful lot of uh, workmen that were uh, killed back uh, then from these uh, competing armies. Well, they would often, in competing with each other, build uneconomic railroads. They would build a parallel set of tracks. For instance, in, in 1860, there were only 30,000 miles of railroad track in the United States. By 1890, there were about 210,000 miles of railroad track, many of them duplicate and, and wasteful. Before the rock on the line is a mighty good road. Well, it's a road to ride. The rock on the line is a mighty good road. If you want to ride, you got to ride it like you fight it. Get your ticket at the station for the rock on the line. If you look, for example, between New York and Chicago, there were five railroads that were competing. Uh, there are even stories of uh, one railroad uh, having cut its rates for moving cattle, uh, was inundated with uh, cattle from a competing railroad. The uh, belief of the competing railroad was that they were losing money on every cow that they shipped, and if enough cows could be shipped on the competitor's railroad, that uh, railroad might fall into bankruptcy. Two of the fiercest competitors were the Burlington and the Union Pacific. Their tracks ran parallel, often less than 20 miles apart. In the 1920s, Gene Proudfit of the Union Pacific was sent to spy on the Burlington's trains. To keep track of the competition, we would count the type of cars in each train so that we could get a gauge on who is getting the most business. Counting the cars was sort of a chore, particularly in the wintertime, because it got cold in Denver. I discovered that the trainmaster of the Burlington was also counting our cars. So we contacted each other and agreed that we would trade consists of type of cars and stay in the office and avoid the cold. <laughs> 
the railroads actually had a monopoly in a lot of areas. So therefore, they could set their own freight rates. And uh, the farmer, of course, was subject to whatever those rates would have been, and it would have been impossible for him to have hauled his products any great distance. The, and he lost money because of the higher freight rates, and it cost, uh, caused a lot of hard feelings between the railroads and the farmers. Farmers felt that the railroads had uh, exploited them, that this monopoly had uh, uh, been created and had simply was stealing their produce by their monopolistic rates, was just driving them to, to the poorhouse. And a whole political movement, the populist political movement, grew up in the rural areas particularly as a result of this feeling. Popular opinion had turned against the railways. They were no longer the creators of opportunity. The big-time speculators and railway tycoons became famous for business practices that were lucrative and often dubious. The shenanigans they were up to were almost without end. For one thing, they would issue stock without any warning. They would just print 100,000 shares and dump it on the market without anybody knowing about it ahead of time. And of course, if you were trying to buy control of a railroad and the management of that railroad suddenly doubled the number of shares outstanding, it made it much more difficult to get control. And in 1868, that's exactly what the Erie Railway did when Commodore Vanderbilt was trying to buy control. They simply printed it. Vanderbilt spent seven million on these new shares. Jay Gould, owner of the Erie Railway, put Vanderbilt's money in a carpet bag and fled Wall Street for an armed fort across the river. Jagold operated in a business world that was pre-regulation as we understand it today. Uh, it was a free-for-all time. Uh, the rules were very loose to the extent there were any rules. I think Jay enjoyed a rather bad publicity throughout his life. There were times when he endeavored to uh, cure it, to deal with it, and he, I think, bought a newspaper at one time or perhaps one or two um, burnish his image a little bit through that newspaper. The robber barons had few scruples. Sometimes they bought newspapers. Other times it was the law. The relationship with politicians was often, well, shall we say, intimate. New York state government was very, very, very corrupt in the 1860s. Um, the legislature could be bought, the governor could be bought, the judges could be bought, and they all were bought. And um, bribery was really the only way to get business done. Um, because if you didn't bribe the legislature to get the law the way you wanted it, your opponent would bribe the legislature to get the law the way he wanted it. And very often you'd end up with both sides bribing the legislature and the legislature having a fine time. And, um, of course, the people's interest was not very important here. The fortunes of one railway enterprise would reveal the growing rift between the people's interests and those of the railway bosses. The Pullman Palace Car Company of Chicago had set new standards for comfort. Pullman became a byword for first-class travel. Their sleeping and dining cars ran on railways worldwide. George Pullman's designs were innovative. He was the first to install electric lights and folding berths. He recruited expert cabinet makers from Germany to build his carriages. Pullman not only had a factory that built the cars, Pullman also was an idealist in some respects, who wanted to create an industrial community where his workers at his plant would both live and work. A community with parks and with water supply and a church. In 1889, the company was worth $43 million. 12,000 workers lived in this model community. Pullman touted his success with his own traveling bag. The workers lived in housing that reflected their level of skill. Pullman Village, its houses and hotel still stand today. And he did it not out of the goodness of his heart, but his notion was that this is the most profitable way to operate. 
because if you have a community of your workers right handy to your shops, and they're not allowed to go to saloons, there can't be no saloon in this town, everybody will have to be sober and get into no trouble, that means they'll get to work on time. And uh, he could do it all and make money, too, because he would be charging these people rent. And he would get his 6% for the Pullman Company off of those houses. Hey, no landlords in Chicago will be making that money. He'll be making it. Great. Except that when the Depression came, the, uh, the Depression of 93, a panic, uh, orders for Pullman cars dropped off. And he did what came very naturally to a corporate uh, tycoon. He decided to cut the wages and to lay off the people. And uh, the people said, well, well, then cut the rent. And he said, no, no cutting the rent. I've got to get the 6%. 6% is sacred. I told my stockholders, 6%. In 1894, Pullman's workers walked off the job. Thousands of railwaymen came out in sympathy. Rail traffic in America all but came to a halt. The dispute turned violent. 34 lives were lost and railway property was burned. The US president sent in 12,000 troops, almost half the army, to restore order. As a result of this strike, the great reputation of George Pullman became the, the symbol of all that was wrong with American capitalism in the minds of the American working class. He was reviled. This man was so afraid that when he died and was buried, he ordered that his, his uh, grave be interlocked with rails welded together, bolted together to, to restrain grave robbers who might dig him up and desecrate him. That was the temper of the time. The political cartoonists had a field day. Jay Gould was one of their favorite targets. He has a delightful cartoon of uh, Jay uh, in a little swing where his uh, interest in uh, communications are strangling the press and commerce. We see Jay Gould playing in Wall Street, uh, entitled Jay Gould's Private Bowling Alley. And then here is a really bitter one in which Sage, Field, Vanderbilt, and Gould are seen being supported by the working people who are barely able to keep their heads above water while the monopolists sit on top with their millions. The groundswell of anti-railway sentiment prompted new legislation to limit the power of the railways. A body called the Interstate Commerce Commission was set up in 1887 to regulate railway activity. Regulation for the railroads meant that they no longer were in charge of their destiny. They no longer were able to give rebates to preferred customers. Regulation meant that railroads had to ask permission of the Interstate Commerce Commission to establish a rate. As a result, price no longer was a means of competition. And it took entrepreneurship out of the uh, railroads. Those that were creative, those that were true businessmen, didn't want anything to do with railroads. <laughs> In 1916, as America prepared to enter the First World War, the president nationalized the railways. The government took operations away from the railway bosses. A new body, the Railway Administration, took control. It was during a railroad administration that the unions became powerful. And the establishment of the eight-hour day and abolition of piecework. For example, uh, uh, cleaning a spittoon had a number and a price. 
I forget the number, but the price was half of one cent. Because I helped make those payrolls in those days. Replacing piecework with an eight-hour day was the first in a series of concessions made to workers during the war. These new rules would prove extremely costly to the railways. Their effects would be felt for decades. A rule was imposed providing that for every 100 miles a train traveled, a crew would receive a full day's pay. Well, that made a lot of sense at World War I because we had steam locomotives. They periodically had to be stopped to be recoaled and be rewatered. And the average speed was about 12 and a half miles an hour or 100 miles in an eight hour period. But by the time we reached World War II and later, we were moving trains at 60, 70 miles an hour. The result was that a crew received multiple days wages for fewer than eight hours of work. After the war, the railways were returned to private hands, but tracks and rolling stock were worn out. The expense of restoring them had to be borne by the companies themselves. At the same time, the manufacturing businesses the railways had helped create were beginning to develop their own new forms of transport. Trucks had come into their own during the Great War. The only thing that stood in the way of civilian use was the lack of highways. In 1919, a young army colonel called Dwight Eisenhower led a caravan of trucks from Washington to San Francisco. His mission was to demonstrate the potential of motor transport and lobby the government for a national road network. Wherever possible, they traveled the Lincoln Highway, a road built beside the old Union Pacific tracks. Bad conditions made the journey arduous. The convoy averaged five and two thirds miles an hour. Not quite so good, wrote Eisenhower, as even the slowest troop train. Three months later, they arrived in San Francisco. It drew a lot of newspaper attention at that time, of course. My father, who was then a, a locomotive engineer, uh, suggested to me that uh, if he were having to live his life over again, even in choosing a profession, he thought he would get into the road business rather than the railroad business because Roads and trucks and vehicles of that kind, that kind of transportation was certainly going to outdistance the railroads and put them out of business, probably. or no roads, the automobile liberated Americans to travel where they wanted, when they wanted. In the 20s, the car posed a challenge to the passenger train. The prosperity wouldn't last. The Wall Street crash of 1929 was a setback for the motor industry. For the railways, it was worse. When I went into the railroad business as a security analyst in 1934, we were in the midst of a deep depression. About one third of the railroad mileage was already in bankruptcy. The railroads were also hurt by the fact that their competition increased tremendously as the use of an automobile grew for private transportation, as people rode buses, and the whole atmosphere was against the railroads. It was a beautiful creature. It was this great silver uh, snake with lights that went wow, wow, wow. And this wonderful new kind of a horn. Not the old toot toot of the steam engine, but here's this wailing, honking thing that told you you better get out of the way. <laughs> 
To win back passengers, the railways introduced new high-speed streamlined trains. Streamlined train, fastest train that run, hot water train. Ain't gonna help you none, I'm gonna leave in the morning. Baby on that streamlined train. Only thing I can say, mama, get your mind off of this thing. That was the quickest way of getting across the country. You could start from here around 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the evening. And it, uh, at the best, these best trains that I run, it'd take you two nights to get into California. Yes. They were nice, fine trains. And the ones I run on towards the last had everything on there that you could imagine. They had a maid on there, and they had a secretary on there. And, just nearly everything that a home would have, nearly. My days, we had to furnish the shoe polish. And each bed would have his shoes or her shoes sitting down for you to have them. And they always were more or less in fairly good condition than traveling. Wouldn't be too much unless you run into some that were bad. <laughs> and we have them polished and sit back under each bed. The streamliners borrowed from the competition. They took diesel engines from trucks and styling from cars. The inaugural run of the newest in streamlined trains. It's fun tuning in at 110 miles an hour. A society occasion from New York to Sun Valley in Idaho. Telephone, too. They are Mr. and Mrs. Averill Harriman. Swank on wheels. The streamliner did not bring back the passenger traffic. You just could not get enough people on a train to make it pay. In 1932, a group of railroad lawyers met in Washington. And their luncheon speaker was Amelia Earhart, a very cheeky woman. She had flown across the, uh, the Atlantic. And she got before these railroad executives. They were sitting in the audience, smoking their cigars, having a good old time. And she suggested that someday, airplanes might actually take business away from railroads. Well, these railroad lawyers just erupted in laughter. Today, after months of preparation, an hourly air service starts between New York, Philadelphia, and Washington. The officers of the line believe they offer something new in air transportation to the public. Uh, people had a little saying against the trucks, uphill slow, downhill fast, tonnage first, safety last. Trucks had started as a way of getting goods to the railway depot. But by the 1940s, they were going door to door, bypassing the railway altogether. The truck pulls up to the dock, so it becomes much more direct, it eliminates totally this problem of uh, repackaging and reshipping and rerouting that uh, the, the railroads fixed to their uh, freight car lines or to their uh, tracks uh, were stuck with. As the railways were overtaken, so were the great Chicago stockyards. Cattle could now be purchased at regional markets transported back to local meat packers and carried direct to the customer by truck. Railroads began their, their final march to almost extinction after World War II. And in the 1950s, an interstate highway system was built in the United States. It literally cloned the railroad system. And for a number of railroads, the last time they earned a profit 
was moving concrete to build the interstate highway system. The enterprises that the great railways had spawned brought about their own demise. During the 1960s and 70s, railways all but lost their battle against the competition as lines went bankrupt. Those that survived faced a long haul back to profit. The golden age of American railways had passed. People like to get where they're going in a hurry. In two or three hours, you are where you aiming to go, and on the train, you got to spend two nights, perhaps, to get where on the best train they had. The train, <laughs> train is so slow in making those times according to a plane. Locomotion continues next week and you can find the book at all ABC shops. Tomorrow in True Stories, we look at the mystery surrounding Hitler's death. Why did Soviet intelligence keep the truth hidden for so long until now? What really happened to Adolf Hitler? A fascinating story that was meant to stay a secret tomorrow night at 8.30. Shortly, police drama in the bill.